So welcome to Shop House number five, uh, which is the graduating students of the Masters in Creative Writing Annual Showcase. And as it's 2022, it's kind of phenomenal really that we have, are having a live event. So um, a special welcome for that reason. <laughs> My name is Rosalind Prosser and I'm the program leader in, uh, for the Masters in Creative Writing here at LaSalle College. And I particularly want to make a special welcome to the graduating students who are all in the front row here. <laughs> to the LaSalle Head of Creative Industries, uh, Jonathan Gander, who I was waiting for. <laughs> to LaSalle staff, and there are a number of staff here tonight, which is fantastic to see, to alumni, and there are quite a few alumni here as well from the Masters in Creative Writing, current students, and it's wonderful to see you all here as well. Uh, this will be you in a few years' time. And most importantly, and always left till the last, family, friends, partners, and all with an interest in LaSalle students' success and this achievement of completion. Thank you for your support and for being here tonight to those other people that we all need in our lives. Um, we acknowledge and congratulate the students through the resumption of live readings during this showcase. In 2021, the graduate reading took place on Zoom uh, and I remember it very well, sitting in my apartment here in Singapore. But to return to a live event means so much more because for creative writing and for writing in general, Readings are the kind of stuff of a writer's life. And writing allows uh, us to read on the page in the privacy of our own home, but to hear the writer read their work is indeed a great privilege, and to hear our student writers reading will be one of those rare moments, so I hope we, we can all appreciate it tonight. The graduating cohort numbers 10 this year, and tonight we'll hear from some of these with a guest appearance by Brandon Toe from the class of 2021, which I think is fantastic because I offered uh, for the 2021 students to read tonight to get the opportunity to read because they missed out. Um, the graduating students of 2022 faced a number of difficulties, yet they managed to complete their degrees during the pandemic times when maintaining a focus on writing and research may be seen as either a good distraction, because it can't do anything else, or as very difficult indeed. And I, I kind of land more on the very difficult indeed, because I think the pandemic has produced in many students a, a real uh, set of circumstances that are quite hard and confronting. And, and I think for younger people, they are definitely uh, more confronting. So, being able to complete your master's in that time frame, I think, deserves an incredible round of applause to our students. So you should be proud of your achievement, as I am, and I'm sure uh, everyone else in the audience is. So what will happen tonight is the reading will take place, one reader following the other, according to the uh, handout that you have, and, um, and the leaflet. And on the leaflet, you'll also find a QR code that will tell you more about each of the readers, except Brandon, and you can go back to the past uh, information on the website for information about him. Um, and at the end, I will return to uh, the lectern just to wind things up. But before we finish the intro, I'd just like to thank the students for their work on the text posters, and I really want to refer you to those because they're outside of the main gallery down in the kind of vestibule downstairs and they feature some of the students here uh, tonight, reading tonight. And so you can get a closer up look at their work and you can follow the QR codes there as well to those students. Um, and for this work, I'd like to thank Bryce Sasaki and I see Bryce is there and Mary Stanislaus, who's not here tonight. And for work on the leaflet, and front of house, Subrantu Bahera, um, Sarah Kelly, and Gabrielle Otek Bian. So, thank you very much to the students for their work tonight. But also, and I'll do this at the end again, is the sound, lighting, and production team at LaSalle who've put an amazing amount of work into this. So, 
enjoy the readings and uh, thank you again. And please note your masks must be worn and your mobile phone should be turned off or down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brendan, and uh, well, I'll be reading two personal essays today because Dr. Prosser has generously said we don't have to read from our thesis. I would like to thank her for the trust and trusting us not to read our Harry Potter fanfic erotica. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So this first essay is called Backseat View. My place in the car is in the back seat behind my dad, who always takes the driver's seat. My mom is in the passenger seat and my sister behind her. When my brother was born, eight years after me, he found this spot between me and my sister. For as long as I can remember, my dad has always been a taxi driver. He moved from Comfort's blue to City Cab's yellow, and finally, to Transcap's white and red sedan. During his City Cab stint, he stopped washing his taxi. Why bother, he said, when the rain does the job just as well. I grew up looking at the back of my dad's head, resting on the headrest, him driving me to the school early in the morning before dawn broke, eyes on the road, while I tried to stay awake by counting the number of cars we passed. We were only conscious of each other's presence during those morning commutes, when we were more or less looking in the same direction and waking up together with the rest of Singapore. My dad is a rather stoic person. At home, he prefers to stay in the master bedroom, watching old Chinese serials on his iPad. My mom often has to tell me and my siblings what he's thinking and how he's feeling. A translator by circumstance, the last speaker of a soon-to-be extinct language. It's the one thing about him I take after, this inability to say what I mean. Every mood I'm in is pronounced as alright and fine. It can mean bad, decent or good all at once. Part of our laconic temperament is due to a misplaced belief in what masculinity is, that being a man means remaining unmoved in the face of everything. Part of it is due to us believing that no self-expression can ever be accurate, so there's no point trying. Now I'm learning how to be more honest to the world and with the world, but my dad probably never will. Through the years from primary school to secondary school and finally to junior college, my school got further and further away. A drive that took 10 minutes became 30 minutes and then 45 minutes. Starting from my third year in secondary school, when he drove me to school, he would tune into a local Chinese radio station. At 6.20 a.m., he would turn up the volume right as the daily radio drama began. 6.20 a.m. was also around the time when the morning traffic got heavier. Sometimes, sitting directly behind him, I would notice the same cars day after day plodding onwards next to us. Our time alone in the car became longer, but we still barely spoke. When you drive, always look further than the next traffic light. Set the gear to neutral when stopping at traffic lights. Don't forget to apply the handbrake when parking. Safety is the most important thing, so go slow. My dad would dispense the same few nuggets of driving wisdom hundreds of times over the years, with his seatbelt slung loosely over his shoulder, unclasped. Maybe he was feeling the silence whenever he felt bothered by it. Maybe he was trying to initiate conversation. Maybe he was fulfilling the role of a father, passing down everything he knows to his son. Maybe it was a mix of all the reasons above. Mm. I replied the way teenagers do with a dismissive utterance that didn't even require me to part my lips, a response that scarcely acknowledged whatever he said. He would blunder down the same conversational bits and I would shut them down with cold indifference. That was a tragedy of our father-son dynamic. I can't even remember if I said thank you when I alighted every day, memory being fickle as it is. But I like to believe I did. He's a driver by necessity, having filled every job interview he went for. I guess I take after him in that aspect as well. He's a gambler by calling, having once conceded that most of me and my sister's milk powder was bought using money he won from Mahjong. To him, his greatest achievement is managing to financially support all three children through university without going into debt. It's the one tidbit he would share and allow a hint of pride to seep into. When I was 17, a teacher at junior college offhandedly said that it's bad manners to take the back seat while the passenger seat is free. Something about how it's treating our parents like chauffeurs. Not that I ever know how someone with a chauffeur would think. I took the bad seat because that was the way it had always been, like how a student always takes the same seat in the lecture hall. However, the thought that I had possibly been treating my dad with disrespect made me uncomfortable. Even if it had been unintentional, I didn't want to think of myself as someone who would be rude to my parents. Maybe I should try taking the passenger seat, though I wasn't sure what difference it'd make. 
we will probably continue ma maintaining our appropriate differential emotional distance. A few weeks later, I finally went through with moving up front. Even entertaining the thought of doing it felt like breaching an unwritten contract. I had only four hours of sleep the previous night because of a new video game I just bought. Years later, I learned that being tipsy feels the same as waking up after not getting enough sleep. Dad, walking ahead of me, reached the taxi and got in first. I, groggy and half awake, opened the car door and hopped in the passenger side before I could stop myself. He was a little surprised by the gesture and looked in my direction, though he didn't say a thing. After I clasped the seatbelt, I turned towards him, not sure why he still hadn't started driving yet, the way he usually did the moment I got in the car. Our eyes met and he turned away. He put the gear stick into place, stepped on the gas and drove. Right, so that was the first piece, uh, backseat view. Okay. And uh, for the second piece, well, I would like to thank Dr. Wetter, who was the program leader uh, in 2020. He instilled in us this confidence right freely, stating that, uh, quote, no one reads our shitty first draft. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read my shitty first draft. <laughs> All right. So this is called I Witness a Slashing. I witnessed a slashing. It happened around 5.30 p.m. on a Thursday. That time when work for the day was done and starting a new task felt too cumbersome. So my colleagues and I pretended to be occupied instead. Then, shouts from downstairs, from the street. Like middle-aged Chinese uncles after they downed two buckets worth of tiger beer. But in mere seconds, the shouting intensified beyond the vigour of drunken rage. Like the capable Singaporeans that we are, coupled with the impulse to find anything other than actual work to do, we ran to the toilet, where the window behind the toilet bowl offered the best view as he overlooked the alley where the action was taking place. Initially, I saw someone wielding a manual display stand like a spear. Though from my vantage point with light reflecting off the laminated menu, it looked like some kind of film equipment. However, in the next instant, a man brandishing a Chinese cleaver lunged at the person with the manual display stand, his hands bloody up to the wrist, almost like he was wearing red latex gloves. With a flimsy swipe of the menu display stand, the attack was warded off, almost as if the attack was fueled purely by bluster. Took me a few more moments before I figured out we weren't looking at a film shoot, though the severity of the situation hadn't sunk in yet. My colleagues and I joked about the questionable efficacy of the menu display stand as a pole arm. And as we took in the situation, it dawned on us that we were witnessing a legitimate slashing. Slashings. Growing up in Singapore, it's hard to avoid hearing about them. They have long gelled into mode stuck in the corner of our culture's consciousness. Slashings are teenage delinquents on crime watch, wielding power and charging at each other with their unconvincing acting that somehow comes across as earnestly over the top, yet also paradoxically half-hearted. Slashings are the occasional newspaper headlines in bold letters set above the fold on those NTUC newspaper racks. They are too easy to miss. Slashings are the splatters of blood on concrete that look like dried gravy which get washed off in hours. Forgetting about slashings is just too convenient. Over a decade ago, I heard about a slashing that happened near Chochukang MRT station. I don't remember who told me about it, nor did I see anything that suggested a slashing had happened. All I remember was that the following day after a supposed slashing, a jewellery store at the MRT station, close to where the old bus interchange used to be, ran a promotion. Big poster saying slash prices all over, with a black background, white numerals and bright red slash marks, offering cheaper deals on heartland retail jewellery, were plastered on every wall of the outlet. The promotion ran for two weeks, without any backlash. I don't think the slashing itself was reported either. See, in Singapore, slashings are like suicides. We know they happen. We pass by places where they happened, unaware of their spectre. The closest I've been to a suicide is hearing the sound of a body hitting the ground. Though I didn't know what it was at the time. It was only after my mom told me that someone jumped off our block almost an hour later that I put two and two together. I heard the dull thunder of body hitting ground on a clear day yeah, I didn't even see the patch of ground being cordoned off by the police and the medics. All traces of tragedy were gone by the next day, cleaned up with Singapore's trademark efficiency. As far as family is concerned, I only found out that my uncle, who passed away before I was born, took his own life when my mum indifferently made an offhand remark about it, as if it's a casual bit of trivia. I never knew that uncle, though I always knew his absence. He was the portrait of a stranger whenever my family went grave sweeping. The missing number between my second uncle and my dad, who is the fourth son. The presence of both slashings and suicides is almost mundane, a part of the background cacophony of life here. If you're lucky enough, we won't ever have to witness either, not just because it could be a deeply traumatizing experience, but because of what it could say about us as people. 
my colleagues and I were joking about what we saw. The first reaction when we realized that we were first hand witnesses of the crime? Exhilaration. Maybe it's because we were safe, being two floors above the action. Detached. Maybe it's because we didn't see the most horrifying moment when steel rendered flesh. Maybe it's because we couldn't see the victim. Maybe I'm just making excuses for my incredulity, thrill, excitement. We all wore this wide-eyed, jaw-dropped smile of an expression. I've read about how in certain cultures, people laugh or giggle when feeling uncomfortable. Yeah, let's go with that. At that point, I thought maybe it was a gang fight since we saw more, pe more people tossing things at the attacker. Thankfully, the truth is much more heartening. The brave employees of steamboat restaurants in the area were deterring the lone attacker from doing any more damage to the victim. One colleague reminded another to video the incident, so he did. We wondered if we should call the police and settled on the idea that someone else probably already did. A few seconds later, I decided to call the police, so at least I can preserve my self-image as a good person. Turns out calling the police is quite similar to calling Singtel customer service support. All operators are busy, dot, dot, dot. please hang on. And then the short jingle that sounds vaguely like elevator music. Soon, the call went through, a report was made, and my duty as a responsible citizen was complete. Still at the window, with the brave men flinging furniture at the attacker no longer in view, or facing off with the attacker, we saw the attacker duck into the steamboat restaurant before coming up with two cleavers, one in each hand. We made a few jokes about dual wielding, which in pop culture parlance is seen as the epitome of cool by teenage boys who play video games too much. We half chuckled. The attacker was alone, and it seemed like no one knew he was back in the alley. He tried to slit his wrist, and even took the blade to his throat, trying to cut himself. But the attempt appeared non-committal and lackluster, as if he imagined the act but couldn't actualize it. He then ran back indoors, out of our sight. Eventually, the police arrived and cordoned off the area. There was an inconspicuous black bag on the ground next to the door the attacker ducked into. Police officer rummaged through the bag and found two passports. My colleagues and I moved away from the window and made a few more jokes. Coping mechanism, I tried to convince myself. I soon headed off for dinner at Toast Box where the bustle of everyday life went on. People were talking, eating, drinking, living. Everything was normal there, just one street away from the crime scene. I could hear the ambulance and police sirens taper off into the distance. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anisha, and thank you all for joining us this evening, ditching your exciting Friday night plans to hear a bunch of creative writing nerds talk. Um, I appreciate your bravery. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Prosser for gi giving us this opportunity to present in person. It's both nerve-wracking and exciting in equal parts. I'd also like to thank Dr. Weather for joining us virtually um, in another time zone. Thank you, Dr. Weather. Um, today, I'm going to read a personal essay that I wrote as part of the creative uh, nonfiction module. It was first published in Quarterly Literary Review Singapore in the July 2020 issue. Um, it's called The Story Behind the Scar, The Time My Dog Bit Me in the Face. I grew up with one sister, six parrots, one rabbit, and a tank full of goldfish. But all I ever wanted was a dog. On the morning of my sixth birthday, I saw the most beautiful German shepherd propped next to my pillow, gawking at me with hazel eyes. I held him close to my chest and wondered, how long would it take for him to love me back? Soon, Ma said. Soon you'll get a real one, and tore off the hallmark tag clipped to his ears. I was nine when my sister got diagnosed with asthma. She was six at the time, too young and too tired to comprehend the arguments that ensued between Ma and me. Have you seen her condition? Pet dander is the last thing we want in the house. Ma thought she was meeting me halfway when she took me to a guy who sold the most exotic and endangered birds and reptiles, the kind one only sees on the likes of National Geographic. She returned home that day with two parrots and a slightly less sulky daughter. By the time my sister parted with her inhalers for good, I was a 10th grader who had nearly flunked her half-yearly math exam. The dream of getting a dog got buried under the weight of trigonometry calculus and parental pressure. Besides, as a teenager, my priorities had shifted to finding the most painless way of getting rid of armpit hair, penning the wittiest one-liners on slam books, trying on outfits for high school parties, and writing poems about my imaginary boyfriends. During the second year of college, a friend told me about a lady who had started a non-profit welfare organization to rescue abandoned dogs. She was described as fierce and stubborn by local newspapers. I couldn't wait to write an email to the crazy dog lady asking for her role. 
any role really. After a month of color correcting digital posters, sending promotional emails to strangers, and doing other mind numbing tasks, I was asked to stand in at the adoption stall in a decrepit parking lot outside a mall in South Delhi. I remember that evening vividly the bamboo facade which looked like it could fall any moment, the burnt caramel smell from the cotton candy stall next to ours, the cheap satin bed sheets spread on our counter on which sat heart shaped pillows stamped with the words puppy love. An hour before the closing time, I stepped out from the back to help Geeta, a 30 something volunteer, feed the eight puppies who weren't so lucky to get adopted that day. She was surrounded by feeding bottles which had traces of milk inside. This one's not eating, it's got a stomach bug, Geeta exclaimed, pointing towards a timid looking mongrel who could pass off as a Labrador if you ignored his long, pointy Pinocchio nose. I took the Pinocchio nose pup in my lap and offered him my hand. He sniffed it and licked it promptly. I couldn't have asked for a better handshake. She likes you, Geeta said. It's a she? I was going to take her home with me. Don't think it's safe to bring her to the shelter tonight. You know what? You take her. I looked at the pup, white as a lamb, soft as a dove, and stroked her ratty head the way I would pet my plush toy. And in that moment, I just knew what I had to do. Shiro, my little lamb at the age of three, not so little anymore, was sleeping where she slept every day on the edge of my bed, on top of my blanket when I returned from work around midnight. With her head delicately tucked between her paws, she looked ridiculously adorable. The face of bliss, we had called it. I bent over to kiss the top of her head. It wasn't the first time, but it would be the last time ever. I can't recall very well what happened next. I remember feeling weightless like I was floating on a cloud, although in reality, I don't think I could have even blinked without help. I remember seeing blush gushing like water from a broken dam down my chin, discoloring my baby blue shirt and the marble floor underneath me. I remember wanting to lie down like my life depended on it. There were screams, mine, and then Mars. A few minutes later, an aunt who lives in the same building appeared in her nighty and held my right arm as Ma tucked my left arm under her elbow. Together, the three of us walked out of the house like soldiers scurrying away from a battlefield. This appears to be a six-degree dog bite, announced the young doctor in the emergency room of Gangaram Hospital. Fifth degree, the patient is alive, corrected his senior, a bespectacled man in his fifties. Laceration on the lower lip, deep cuts on the chin, needs at least eight or nine sutures. We'll have to call the plastic surgeon to stitch you up, he declared to Ma, who was standing beside my stretcher. Promise me you won't do anything to Shiro, I said to Ma as the nurse stabbed my vein to inject medicines with unpronounceable names. How about you focus on getting better first, she said while stroking my cold feet, peeking out of the thin hospital blanket. Anyway, the doctors asked us to monitor Shiro's health. The word rabies hung on her lips but remained unspoken. In my mind, I knew she was fine. She had to be. She'd been nothing but a perfectly loving dog who loved the same food I did, chicken dumplings and curd rice, and played with the same toys I grew up playing. Her favorite, too, was the ratty, tattered, doggy soft toy. With a tiny morsel of assurance and some hospital-grade drugs, I drifted in and out of a comfortable numbness. The rest of the night, or whatever was left of it, passed quickly. Nurses came, nurses left. A cloud of familiar voices passed over me. Early in the morning, I was taken into the operation theater. It looked exactly like I pictured it, a scene from Grey's Anatomy. During the recovery period at home, Shiro and I were kept physically apart at all times. Every now and then, I heard her whimpering from the other side of the door, pleading to be led into my room, her room. What do we do with her now? Ma asked nonchalantly. Drop her at the shelter, hissed my aunt. Give her a second chance, pleaded my sister over the phone. Back in my village, a mad dog like her would have been shot with a gun, scoffed grandma. So are you going to give her away? My best friend texted. I pictured Shiro in a filthy three feet filthy cage, refusing to eat just like she did when I, when I was gone for three days. The image of her yelping in pain, she had broken her hind leg once, invaded my mind like a nightmare. How would I face the thought of sleeping on the cold floor and not on her bed, my bed? How would I ever forgive myself for abandoning her? I knew this was my test, the real test of love. Everything I knew about myself, about my dog, was distilled into this one moment. She can't go, I said to Ma. 
it wasn't her fault. She was in deep sleep. I woke her up. I frightened her. Maybe she was having a nightmare about the street dog who had gotten into a fight with her. Maybe she thought I was the street dog, I said between sobs. There was a long pause. Oh, honey. Now Ma was sobbing too. Shiro is nearly 13 now, sleeping more and eating less than usual. Twice a year when I go back to my house in Delhi, she greets me with drools and a dancing tail. I pet her under Ma's supervision and kiss her in my head. We sleep in different rooms, on different beds, like lovers grown apart. Every time someone shows me a tattoo of their pet, I show them my scar. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kevin. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming, especially to all my teachers and friends who are here tonight. Um, your support and encouragement has really gotten me through this past year and made me believe that I could write something of quality and something to be proud of. Um, I would like to give a brief introduction before going into my reading. As part of my master's thesis, I wrote a collection of four short stories under the title Isle of Misfits. This collection is essentially a love letter to the underrepresented and unseen in Singapore those who feel like they don't belong. Hopefully sending the message that everyone's voice should not only be tolerated, but also be retreated with respect and dignity, and that there is space for everyone's stories. The excerpt that I'll be reading tonight is from one of these stories entitled, We're In This Together, which centers around the gay community in Singapore and the struggles and dilemmas we face here. Um, I'm happy to share that this revised version will soon be published in an anthology later this year. So I uh, hope you enjoy. Um, we're in this together. We arrive at Hong Lim Park at a respectable hour, fourish in the afternoon. Calling it a park is an act of self-aggrandizement, akin to calling a matchstick a bonfire. It is simply an empty field, plopped randomly in the middle of Chinatown a sole patch of burnt green amongst the sterile office buildings with windows the color of dark water. There is a circular stage built in the front, perfect for an outdoor concert, but never so used. The police will be overwhelmed by the influx of complaints. Instead, the space is used for peaceful rallies, the only place in Singapore where they're legal. Applause fizzles like a frying pan without enough oil. The host on stage, a heavy-set man with pepperish hair and poorly made angel wings on his back, already shedding feathers, yells into the loud hailer he is holding. He sounds like he's just stubbed his toe. Come on, everyone. You can be louder than that. The crowd squeezes out an unenthusiastic, angry cheer as if we are in a classroom greeting a teacher we must tolerate. A signpost outside the park reads, Speaker's Corner. And that's exactly what it is. A corner, a sliver of a wedge, a whisper that will be competing with and instantaneously lost to the noise of the traffic outside, even if we raise our voices. Oh my gosh, can they faster or not? I'm melting here, Marcus cries out holding one of those handheld folding fans trying to cool himself. The hand fan is as white as a plate, unnecessarily ostentatious with lackluster wind power. His bee-like nasal voice downplays his masculinity. He is Super Mario on steroids, complete with the mustache. We get it, you're hot. There's no need to show off, Pat says, with a condescending drawl that gives away his age. He is the oldest amongst us, but doesn't look it, with a wrinkle-free face thanks to the rewinding wonders of Botox. Being friends with the dermatologist has its perks, although Pat tells me I still have a good two years before considering a visit. Shut it, Marcus. You're the one practically wearing half a shirt, I hiss. Say people say yourself, you whore. We laugh like school kids who share a giddy secret language. The queers around us are staring. It happens. There's always a certain je ne sais quoi whenever the group gets together. The way heads turn minutely like hands of a clock. 
Eyes lingering for a tad too long, different from the regular passerby. The look of shock, jealousy, and admiration all at the same time. Though none of us are willing to admit it, we are showing off, boasting our bronzed, chiseled bodies carved out from ours at the gym, wearing shirts we would never admit might be straight jackets. The gaze here search for the sharp curve of muscle before anything else. I always thought that if I could get those six-pack abs, finally climbing the raised ladder that they resemble, that I would be greeted with some triumphant reward. But now that I've reached the figurative peak, the view is pretty much the same, and I have no one to share it with, besides my so-called friends perpetually looking somewhere else. The clouds are withering beards in the distance, far away now. The sun has grown tired, shrinking into a pale beige dot, seeking shelter behind the glass towers surrounding the area, though the heat is still inescapable. You can detect the brimming sizzle in the air if you look hard enough. The stereotypical dance music is loud but obnoxious. No one around us is dancing. We're all just limp, sweaty figures, waiting to be let in. Waiting, we're always waiting in this perpetual state of queuing, rarely taking the time to relish a moment, even when it calls out to us so effervescently. Something like the pure expression of love can pass you by in an instant, just as how people always say when conversation runs thin. Can you believe how fast the year has gone by? I was reminded of such a passing when the inkling of love slipped through my inexperienced hands when a possibility of a future together, of day-to-day -day domestic mundanity, seemed within reach. Leonard and I had booked a staycation to celebrate our three-month anniversary, the only time we could be alone. Before this, we settled for afternoon meals and casual strolls along the veined routes of New Road and Duxton Hill, lined with antiquated shop houses converted into an alternate shuffle between shoddy Korean barbecue joints and intentionally darkened bars, a safe haven for the queers. When will we ever have a place like this? Leonard sang longingly. It was one of those modern service apartments that came furnished with everything one needs for a home, including a stainless steel fridge amidst a decent sized kitchen, and even a washer and dryer stacked atop each other beside it all of which communicated an unsettling but exciting permanence, like the prickly feeling of falling off your bed even though you're nowhere near the edge. Once I reach 35, I guess, I said, you too, that's the rule for us, you know, since we can't get married here. That's HDB, government owned, different. We can't spend our lives waiting for things to be handed to us. And have you seen the new showroom models lately? Civil servants really have no taste. His body was facing the glass bay windows which overlooked the Marina bay, bay waterfront. His expression sanguine, looking past the crystalline skyline and into the distant blue yonder, his eyes gleaming like fresh water from a spring. I had a feeling he wasn't just talking about the apartment. Maybe one day, in the blank cloudless future he was trying to picture, there would be a place for us, just maybe. We spent most of our time huddling in bed after sex, watching videos from my laptop, exchanging our lives, telling our stories through other people, the role models who shaped us, for in them, we could find ourselves. There wasn't anyone like us then. Our favorite Madonna concert was Who's That Girl? Not Blonde Ambition with the iconic conical bra. The only difference was I had watched them on Laserdisc while he, the millennial, stumbled across clips on YouTube. I always wanted to be the boy dancing next to her during the opening number. He wanted to be Madonna. Why? Well, who wants to be the backup dancer? Wouldn't you rather be the star? Beyond the confines of the apartment, there were excursions to get groceries to test out hip Bon Appetit recipes and making the necessary trips to the indoor gym. While I did the usual dumbbell routine, Leonard had to be different. 
After finishing my last set, I found him sitting by the empty corner in a most peculiar position. His legs split wide open, forming an almost parallel line to the floor, a wishbone on the cusp of breaking apart. His chest was touching the ground, his head floating just above, looking like a turtle coming out of its shell. My gaze shifted to his feet, which were incongruously sparkling. He had on red bedazzled heels, like the ruby slippers from the Wizard of Oz, but a grown-up version, if Dorothy had grown up to become a stripper still stuck in Kansas. The spiked acrylic ends of the heels could easily puncture a tire. I imagined the insides of my cheeks to be like them, resplendent, shining brightly behind a dull layer of nude. We were trains running in opposite directions, one headed to Pasiris, the other to Jukun, extreme ends of the island that made our worlds seem separate, two things that shouldn't go together, but did. In those three days, without the rest of the world watching, anything seemed possible. Thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Sarah. Um, many thanks to Dr. Prosser for giving us the opportunity to read, and also thanks to um, Dr. Wetter for supervising my thesis. So I'll be reading from my story, There is Cake in Here. It's about a woman in her 30s who's trying to piece her life back together after cancer and divorce. So she gets overwhelmed with um, online dating and starts to apply this slightly crazy rule that she'll only date men who read books. Uh, Proper books, that is. So literary fiction, go standard. Neil Gaiman, borderline. And anyone who mentions Dan Brown is an immediate discard. So this is what happens next. <clears throat> he is a writer with a day job he hates. Maybe that's why his mood waxes and wanes with the work week. I started talking to him because his list of favorite authors was longer than the rest of his profile put together. The man I call Moody is 41 an American school teacher with an MFA. His dog is his best friend. We've been messaging for less than two weeks, but I got the pattern figured out. He's at his lowest on Friday, human on Saturday, and almost giddy by, by Sunday. It slides from there. It was on the Thursday in his second ever message to me on the dating app that Moody wrote, death is perfect in its inevitability to take us all. There aren't too many perfect things in this world. Shadows are among them. What else out there is perfect? I want to catch him on a Sunday, so when Moody asked this morning whether I was free tonight, I said yes. That was how I ended up stacking two dates on the same evening. The first was with a local poet, also with a day job, at a trendy wine bar. The poet gave his glass a practice swirl and observed the legs of his wine before sipping it. We said we would keep in touch. I'm in a cab on my way to meet Moody at his local hawker center for beer, and I'm feeling the jitters. I can't message the girls for support. They, a three-nation panel of dating experts, have already downvoted him for various infractions. Why are you even meeting him? They wanted to know. He is not tall, but better looking than his profile picture. He has good skin, pre pretty anxious eyes, and a sad puppy quality that's endearing. At the Hawker Centre, where port workers in high-vis vests dined off plastic tableware under fluorescent lights, I am awkward in my silk dress and heels from the earlier date. He has sweat stains on his t-shirt from his rush to meet me. My fault, I was early. I feel a surge of warmth for the man and reach up for the hug. And he says, oh, I was just going for a high five. It feels surreal to be led about by an American in this most local of places. Even more surreal when we land in front of a congee stall, fortified with huge blue light rimmed speakers across its front, blasting techno. A tiny woman swaggers out from behind the speakers, swearing in Hokkien. She's my age, but looks younger with her bleached pixie haircut and oversized t-shirt. I hate techno, but I like her already. Ling is a lesbian, and she and Moody are bros, best buds. 
Moody and I settle down at a table in front of Ling's stall to shout at each other over beer and thumping techno. My stomach starts rumbling and I look at the stalls around us. This is a popular hawker center with a solid reputation. All the local staples are here. Chicken rice, fried kway teow, my favorite bak chor mee, a spicy vinegary noodle dish that I had missed constantly during my 15 years living in Europe at the US. I'm still deciding what to order for dinner when Moody plunks a huge pack of nuts on the table. Food here gives me stomach trouble, he explains. I blink, then take another swig of my beer. You don't dive? He's asked this before. Diving features prominently on his profile. Nope. Can you swim? Not well. When his contract finishes at the end of the year, Moody plans to move to Thailand and become a dive instructor. He wants a companion. Ling keeps coming to clink mugs with us, getting steadily drunker as the evening progresses. At one point, she wraps her arms around Moody's neck and smacks her lips on his bald head. He grins back at her. Their affection is catching. I don't know how they communicate. Ling's English is rudimentary, and Moody doesn't speak anything else. Maybe it's the universal language of loneliness. Moody can't wait to finish his contract. He hates teaching middle school and seems to despise the children. He perks up when I redirect the conversation to writing. He is writing a book of short stories set in this very hawker center featuring Ling. His protagonist interrupts us again, this time with an invitation to go clubbing. We decline. Is she usually like this? I ask. Three tables away, Ling is slamming plastic trays and picking a fight with someone. Moody tells me that a year ago, Ling's then girlfriend and Konji stall partner ran off with the man from the chicken rice stall next door. This being tax season, the ex-lover slash business partner has had to call Ling to discuss store related tax matters. Old wounds were reopened and I'm watching them bleed in real time. Ling is kicking something now. At this rate, she'll hurt herself. Should we do something? I ask. Moody doesn't answer. He seems repulsed by Ling's misery. Whatever happened to Best Buds? Ling finally exhausts herself and settles down, settles down at a table to moan into her arms. Moody tries to resume the conversation, but I keep looking over. Her small folded body is alone and hurting while the world carries on around her. Same thing happened to you, huh? What? I turn to Moody, startled. He is eyeing me warily. It dawns on me that he thinks I'm concerned about Ling because I relate as a fellow jilted woman. It does not occur to him that I might just be a decent human being. I left, I want to tell him. I left a marriage that was finally providing financial security after many years of sacrifice. A marriage that came with medical insurance, sweet, sweet insurance that took care of the horrific six-figure hospital bills when I got sick. Insurance I'll miss when I get sick again. I left anyway. During the marriage, we moved countries again and again from Asia to Europe to the US so he could chase his dream career. There were years of uprooting myself over and over, giving up friends, family, careers, opportunities. I kept cutting away pieces of myself so he could be whole. One day, I thought, I will get a turn. In the end, even cancer couldn't make him give me a turn. So I took the little piece of myself I had left, and I ran. Yet here I am, half starved, half drunk, sweating into a fancy dress on a plastic stool, on a stupid date with a man who despises children, a man who writes stories about his trophy, local friend, but can't be bothered to comfort her when she's in pain. Another man who won't give someone else a turn. Ignoring Moody's confusion, I get up to go to Ling. This is my first day dating in a decade and a half. It's near midnight, and I'm in a hawker center, hugging a lesbian congee seller, pressing her soft stained t-shirt to my silk dress. As I rock her, I chant over and over in Mandarin, forget the bitch, she's not worth it. I tell my friend Liz about the date the next day, I meant it as a funny story, but she says to me very gently, Em, you deserve better than this. Sure, 
I tell her. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Fong. Um, so uh, first of all, I'm, I, I want to thank Dr. Bursa for Dia's opportunity to read tonight. And I want to thank all my teachers and especially my supervisor, Robert Siegel, uh, for guiding and shaping my writing in the past three years. Um, and I want to thank especially my boyfriend, Benny, for relentlessly sparring with me on plot points and character portraits um, over the past uh, three years as well. So, uh, thank you. So what um, I'm gonna read uh, today, um, I'm gonna read a uh, short excerpt from my um, novel Mobius, uh, not to be confused with the Marvel movie. <laughs> um, so Mobius is a, a novel of three parts, um, spanning three decades, telling the story of two conversion therapy survivors. Um, so what I'm gonna read is the last segment of uh, the first decade. And I'm gonna end with um, a short poem. So I want to thank and dedicate this reading to all the members of the LGBT community who have been harmed by conversion therapy, who are seeking to heal, and who are raising to make up for lost time. <coughs> A skinny woman in her mid-30s lies in one of the A&E beds with bones sticking out of her elbow and blood dripping off them. She wails at the top of her voice as a few nurses try to calm her down and administer tranquilizer. Doctors pace up and down the hall fighting for space with stretches going in opposite directions. The A&E room at Jiangyi General Hospital is carnage, even on a good day. Lucas is still unconscious though his head has been ripped in a bandage by the paramedics to stop the bleeding. Herman freezes as the chaotic sounds and sights of the place fade into black. He cannot move his eyes away from Lucas, lying still under the bright neon lights. He looks as if he is sleeping, but Herman wishes he could be up, crying, yelling, hitting him, or doing anything but sleep. Sorry, sir? Sir? A nurse interrupts Herman's days. Yes, miss. Are you his family? No, I'm his friend. Herman hesitates. He's not exactly sure what they are, telling the nurse that they are lovers who just make no sense to her and serve no purpose. We need to contact his family. We may need to do uh, an emergency surgery. The nurse's voice is calm for the message that she's delivering. What kind of surgery? We, we can only tell his family. The nurse a voluptuous Malay lady in her 40s answers Herman while flipping through a bunch of patient charts. Do you have his uh, landline number? Um, let me call his parents. Herman drags his feet down the hall and finds a payphone. He starts dialing Lucas's house but stops halfway. Then he dials his home but hangs up when someone picks up. Herman recognizes his father's voice. But a lecture is the last thing he needs now. He was expecting his mother to pick up. All the show of strength and defiance he has put up is collapsing like a rock fall. He wishes he could be in church now to pray for an answer that guides him on what to say to Lucas's parents. Hello? Is this Lucas's home? Herman finally plucks up the courage, though his voice trembles. Yes, where is he? Who are you? A deep, hurried voice is on the other side, which Herman presumes is that of Lucas's father. He had a fall and is at Jiangyi General Hospital now. I am Herman, his friend from church. Okay, we are coming right now, and, and we don't want to see you there. But Herman tries to explain himself and asks if he can stay. But Lucas's father already hangs up. Herman drops the phone. A loud beeping sound tries to break through the noisy hall. Herman drops down on the floor, leans against the wall, and starts weeping like a child. What if Lucas really needs brain surgery? What if he cannot wake up and stays in a vegetative state for the rest of his life? What if he dies? The durian aroma mixed with the scent of dried blood now smells like death to him. He wants to find out if Lucas will be okay, and he won't leave until then. 
Seven hours has passed since Herman loitered near the hospital registration counter, waiting for Lucas to be out of the woods. Lucas' parents had never met him, so he could stay around as long as he did not draw any attention to himself. Herman only heard bits and pieces of the doctor's conversation with Lucas' parents, but he could make out that Lucas' situation was grave. He would have such a risky brain surgery that it might leave him vegetative or even dead. Herman's heart sank deep into his stomach. He has only felt like this once when his grandma passed away. He remembered praying to God that his grandma would be in heaven so that he could be reunited with her one day again. He has not prayed for anything or anyone else ever since he realized that, to the church, people like him could only go to hell. Yet now, he finds himself clasping his hands together and closing his eyes to pray for Lucas. He does not know if God still hears him, but he would like to try anyway. The A&E room is relatively empty now and quiet, except for the snoring of an old uncle who is still waiting for his daughter's operation to be over. Herman has to keep avoiding the nurse that met him earlier so he won't get chased away. He is sitting only one row away from Lucas' parents. His dad wears a pair of horn rim glasses, looks rather frail, and is probably in his mid-fifties. His mom, a slender woman, dressed in a blue t-shirt with a grey cardigan with hair tied up in a bunch, has a stern and threatening look that somehow makes Herman avert his eyes. He eavesdropped on their conversation. If he had stayed in church, none of this would have happened, his mom said. But if he had not gone to church from the beginning, he would not have met that boy and he would have been safe. His dad looks annoyed. But you know he's there because he loves God and loves us, right? His mom raises her voice a little. Her high cheekbones are even more imposing. But we could just leave him be. How can you say that? His behavior is not normal. This is not who God intends for him to be. Forget it. Let's pray for him. His dad takes out a rosary. Herman cannot help but thinks Lucas is dead. He's just like his mom, caught in between their children, spouses, and God. He wonders if he can have a word with Lucas' father when he's alone, just to tell him how terribly sorry he is. But a thought quickly escapes him every time he sees Lucas' mother. It is over. Your son is stable now. In his blue scrubs and bouffant surgical cap dotted with white birds, the young surgeon walks over to Lucas' parents. He looks exhausted. Sweat is still visible on his forehead. Lucas' parents stand up, tearing up in relief. His mom embraces the surgeon and sobs while his dad kisses the rosary many times. He probably will lose strength in his legs for a while, but he will be okay, the surgeon says. Herman feels a weight lifted from his chest. Lucas will live. He is about to stand up and leave when the emission nurse walks down the hall and greets him. Mr. Go, I thought you left. Your friend is just out of surgery. He's stable now. Damn the nurse. She's too loud. Lucas' parents hear her and turn to look at Herman. Their face is brimming with confusion and hints of anger and blame. Lucas' mom walks towards Herman but he bolts out of his seat and runs down the hallway towards the acid. It is raining outside, and Herman is soaked. The dry blood on his t-shirt mixes with the rain and spreads a little. He takes it off and throws it into the bin before collapsing on the ground. He looks on at the headlights of the cars coming towards him. Herman lies motionless in bed, staring at the ceiling in his bedroom. It has been six months since the accident. He has not been able to eat and sleep properly. Eves has been trying to invite him over for dinner with her mom and herself, but he has taken no interest. Herman keeps thinking about Lucas and wonders if he has regained his strength and is able to walk now. But there is no way he can find out. Lucas has not responded to his texts. Herman has tried to call his home a few times, but his mom was always the one answering the phone. She would chide him, call him the devil, and hang up. His father, Mr. Goh, has not spoken a word to him ever since he came home from the hospital after the surgery. He would avoid eye contact with Herman every time he met him in the living room or at the dining table. 
though Herman has not been there much lately. Sometimes at night, he would hear his dad berate his mom for having given birth to a boy like him. His mom did not say a thing, but he could guess she would go to the living room, turn on the TV, mindlessly watch the Channel 8 martial arts drama, and cry to herself. Herman tosses and turns in bed until he suddenly sits up. He can find out more about Lucas from Buster Kong. Perhaps Lucas has returned to the church support group. He gets out of bed, rushes to the living room, picks up the phone and dials Buster Kong's home. Hello? Uh, good afternoon, Buster. This is Herman. There is a long pause on the line. Oh, hi, Herman. I have not heard from you for a while. How are you doing? Buster Kong's response. I have not been great. I am sorry for how I acted in your meetings. Uh, can you tell me if Lucas has come back to the support group? Herman feels conflicted. On one hand, he wants to tell Buster Kong to go to hell. But on the other hand, he has to soften his tone just so he can get the information out of him. Oh, haven't you heard? His parents have sent him to the States to study. Uh, Georgia, I think. There's a good church and a support group there that I heard he's doing great in. Herman pauses. He leans back in the sofa and stares at his grandma's portrait on the wall. He half wants to thank God that Lucas is all right now, and half wants to hurl the phone right at the crucified Jesus statue on the altar. He will not be seeing Lucas again for a long while, and his heart contracts at the thought. Herman, you there? Look, we can put the bus behind us. I have spoken to your dad. There's a new series of sessions starting this Sunday at church. You can come back and we can try. Herman puts the phone down. He goes outside to the common corridor and lights up a cigarette. He looks up at the starless night sky and wonders if somewhere in Georgia, in the States, Lucas is also looking up and thinking about him. Yep, that's, that's the excerpt. Um, so I hope to end with a hopeful note by reading this short poem. Um, it's called The Pink Stars Are Rising. A pink blushy rests on the sofa, blinking fairy lights deck the windows. The boy dips his feet in the pool, water like memories rippling back into the past. Many Junes ago, the boy was left by his mother among a pack of wolves gnawing on a diet of abs and genitals, scurrying around in a disenchanted forest hiding from the eyes of the high court. The boy became a lost wolf preying on other lost boys with wounded paws, blood tripping off, dejected flesh and aching bones. He dreams of coming home to the warmth of the pack, snuggling in his mother's arms like a pup once again. One night when another lost boy kissed him on the lips, he left a note saying, see you again, without ever touching him. The magic of the pink moon turned him back into a boy. The boy loved the other boy. The electric feeling of skin to skin, lips to lips, breath to breath, felt right and wrong at the same time. He was but a Schrodinger's boy, peeking through a hole, seeing the world both existing and disappearing, seeing the moon both rising and setting, seeing the earth both rotating and standing still. He saw a pink dot on a dark earth, blinking in and out of darkness. The lights glimmering in his eyes, he felt the force of a thousand souls, the thousand Schrodinger's boys and girls, and in between us, the lights rose up like pink stars, flickering against the velvety black of the night sky, circling around him, shaped like his first love, his exes, his mom, his bestie. The neon silhouette whispered to him, we've got you. He floated in the air, lights is light, buoyed by currents of pride and hope smelling like fleshly cooked bakute from his mum, like the musky sweat running down the skin of his lover's chest, like the freshly baked cheesecake from his bestie. It smells like love, and love is in the air. Now the water is still, a hand rests on his shoulder. He blinks back into his system. The earth is rotating again. The moon is up high, and the pink stars are rising. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everybody. I just want to thank everybody for coming and uh, allowing us to read our work and bring it to life. Um, I also like to thank, uh, in particular, Dr. Prosser, Dr. Wetter, and Dr. Bali Jaswal, who is in here tonight as my thesis supervisor. 
So tonight I'm going to read the first chapter of my thesis, which is a novel in progress uh, tentatively titled Baby Gravy. One, straight teeth. Two, nice fingernails. That's about it. Mr. Straight Teeth is deep in another anecdote about some apparently amazing legal acrobatics he pulled off. I'm not listening. I'm watching him slice his expensive rib eye rather too precisely while trying to decide how much I want his sperm. He ends with a flourish. Then the universal pause for applause, practiced chiefly by the male of the species. I smile admiringly. He sparkles appreciatively. Men are so easy, even the smart ones. If only I'd known this half a lifetime ago. Oh yeah, three. He's smart. Top schools, big lawyer and all that. I wouldn't have come to dinner otherwise. My kid's gonna need brains just to be averaged here in hyper-competitive Singapore. The other reason I am here is Celia. He's perfect for you, she insisted, rattling off degrees, annual salary, firms he's made partner at. I don't even know where she found him. Instagram? Craigslist? Do people even still use Craigslist? I don't know, Celia, I said. I don't want to rush this. Well, you don't exactly have a lot of time, okay? It's true. I'll be 40 soon deathbed zone when it comes to making babies. All I see when I close my eyes these days are my remaining eggs, looking like tiny balled up fetuses with hangdog police lineup expressions, each more shriveled and starved than the other. But I shook my head at her anyway. Look, Benna, nobody's asking you to fuck him, all right? She grumbled. Just show up and see what you think. The morning sickness has been making her cranky. Straight teeth picks at something on his lap, and I take the chance to peer at the top of his head. Thinning hair would be a definite deal breaker. As it is, he already has a broad, squat nose and is not tall. If I decide a brain makes up for these weaknesses, will my future child forgive me? He reminisces about his Oxford days and how much he misses the UK, while my mind drifts to the blonde in my office building with the really tight ass. Caucasian Asian babies are gorgeous. Ang more genes like his would surely dilute my own flat Chinese features just the right amount to turn out an adorable baby with curly hair, huge eyes, and an actual nose bridge. Then again, maybe I want my child to look like me. People are going to give my kid a hard enough time already. I shouldn't give them more to gossip about. When others look at us in the playground on the first day of school, I want them to see a complete unit, not a missing father to wonder about. No squinting, no computing, no baby looks more like papa, is it? Questions. Just two people who belong to each other. It's ridiculous that in the end, my life's happiness boils down to a throwaway squirt of goop. The same stuff I flushed, trapped in condoms, avoided on the bed sheet, mostly spit, but sometimes swallowed. Semen always signaled the end, sometimes prematurely. For the first time now, it could be a beginning. The sommelier comes by, and straight teeth waxes lyrical about tasting the terroir in the wine. I wonder if I could have sex with him. Imagine leaving the restaurant for his Robin Road address, feeling certain everyone knows what we're doing, slipping out like a shoehorn from under his sleeping body after, or worse, lying stiff as needles, the crumpled bed open between us like a dirty secret. A flash comes to me, Steve's shoulder under my chin, his breath on my neck, plum smooth skin cupped in my hand. I shudder and excuse myself. I need to clear my head. This restaurant has a good restroom, veiny marble, shiny taps, and it's fragrant too. In a cubicle, I stare down the throat of the toilet. Steve, turning out the light, going about the business of fondling me like someone very tired having to take the trash out after a long day. Steve, 
who occupied six years, a half dozen, a small box of donuts, then left me without light bulb of husband or child to activate the lemon juice of my invisible female life. Fucking Steve. After I washed my hands, I wet my fingers and fluffed my hair up at the roots, sucking my cheeks. I haven't aged too badly, but everything is getting steadily softer and lower. Cheeks, boobs, ass. You know you're losing it when you start getting less positive attention from men and less negative attention from women. In the right light, makeup, spanks. I like to think I still pass for mid-30s. Not for much longer, though. As I weave between tables back to my half-eaten poached salmon, a waiter serves a couple a creme brulee. They're rosy and all dressed up, too young and happy to understand they've been relegated to the worst table in the place, right at the back, too close to the kitchen. He feeds her the first bite. Her cheeks flushed from the attention, she grins, a white, sweet custard grin, and I feel a strange pang. Straight teeth spots me and his face lights up briefly like an unanswered message. Hmm. He was afraid I'd left. Was I gone that long? I pretend not to see him looking, but walk a fraction more sexily and jut a hip here and there. He lifts a corner of his napkin, dabbing at his smile. What am I even doing? It's not as if I want to go home with him. So, how does this work? he asks, forced casually, before I've even smoothed my napkin back out. He's done with his steak, so it's down to business. What did Celia tell you? Please let her have gone over the gory bits. You're looking for a sperm donor? His eyes go subconsciously to my chest. Why not a sperm bank? I tell him what I recently learned, that under the law, I'd have to be a married woman with a stable relationship to use the local sperm banks. He whips out his phone and does some loyally searching. You're right, he says. I'm sorry. Yeah, I shrug. No matter how modern Singapore appears, we were founded on Confucian values and the ideal nuclear family. I'm a single woman, a soon-to-be divorcee, an aberration in the shiny tight weave of society. No one's going to make it easy for me to have what I want. So all I'll need is a, a sample from the donor when the time comes, I say. I don't know what else to call it. He's still thumb-scrolling through statutes or something. His lips move as he speed reads. It's almost cute. No artificial reproductive treatments, meaning no IVF or IUI either. You figured out how to uh, administer the sample? Yes, I haven't. Just one sample? Hmm. I somehow assume the first attempt would take. I've been so preoccupied with the idea of single-handedly caring for a red, wiggling infant, even more helpless and needy than a boyfriend, that conceiving it seemed like the easy part. Of course, the stats say otherwise. Three out of ten women my age are infertile. Assuming I'm not, my chances of conceiving in any given month are a mere 5%. Ugh, I'll probably need a refill. How many times can you ask a guy to jack into a cup before you're imposing? So, <laughs> just pump and dump then, he says, with an awkward cough laugh. I smile tightly. There are no guidelines for a situation like this, for discussing the possible mingling of genes with someone you've just met. Have you prepared a donor agreement? He asks quickly. No legal claim on the child, etc. Parents can sue kids for maintenance, you know even if they are illegitimate. And there's the word everyone's been skirting. It's things. It's a horrible label in a world that loves labeling people. I want to be angry, but there's also a certain release now it's out in the air. I lean back in my chair for the first time all night. My salmon has congealed in a slimy white puddle. If I'm going to do this, I have to do it right. Can I get you dessert? I ask, straight teeth. I'll have my creme brulee, with a side of free legal advice. As Celia might say, there's more than one way to milk a man.
Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Muhammad. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Prosser uh, for hosting us this evening, and also to Dr. Weather, who was my supervisor. Uh, I'll be reading a section from my thesis, which is sort of a novel in progress. There are three main characters, but you'll only be hearing from one of them tonight. My niece Anissa's week wedding is this weekend, this whole weekend. Today, Friday afternoon till almost midnight, the entire family has come to set up the decorations and tables and help cook the food. Saturday is a solemnization. Sunday is the reception with the bride and groom sitting, basanding together on the dais. The wedding doesn't end till late Sunday afternoon, very near sundown when the last guest leaves, the last tables are folded, the last of the food is spooned into plastic bags and Tupperware and given out to whichever relatives have hung around to see the wedding to its end. The shadow of my late sister's absence stretches long and dark over this wedding, but I'm the only one who sees it. Mariam should be here. It's her daughter's wedding after all, her only daughter. She lived just long enough to have two children, neither of whom were old enough at the time of her passing to remember her. It's selfish, but I wish the children looked more like her. They don't resemble her in the slightest. Mariam was all round, a chubby, moon-shaped face even in adulthood, a flat pair of a nose sitting right in the middle, a padded jawline smooth as a pebble plucked from a riverbank, its surface eroded by the water's relentless surge above it. Maybe if she had had more children, one of them would have ended up looking like her. Her kids are all their father, hard, rough lines chiseled into a square-shaped face, narrow noses perpendicular to a pair of eyebrows so straight they look drawn on. The only one at this wedding who looks like her is me. I want to go home, but everyone is still sitting down, and besides, we have to be here when the other guests arrive. The preparations are basically done. The sun has just set, and the sky is a gentle blue fading to black. I don't dare look away, and my heart breaks to blink my eyes because I want to see the colors change. I want to see the last yellow in the sky blend into the blue that darkens into black, that lightens into gray once all the street lights and corridor lights turn on. From my chair at the edge of the void deck, within sight and smell of the cigarette choked longkang, I can see the sky blacken and ashen like a wilting flower from above the trees and behind the blocks that jut into the garden of the heavens like weeds. A sudden need to jump into the river, hidden and dwindled behind our estate, possesses me. Something sits on my shoulder and tells me that I should just jump in and let the river, slowly slithering its way towards the open ocean, just take me away. Of course, the rivers don't really flow on their own. They've been hacked at, moved around, warped, stretched thin and bent. On hot, dry days when only gravity and the irresistible pull of the moon drag them out, they flow at a snail's pace. When it rains, the canals that they've been shoved and barricaded into resemble the rivers they must have once been, charging like fish caught in a net, leaping for the freedom of unrestricted waters. Nobody is allowed to jump in, of course, not anymore. Singapore's rivers are for other, higher purposes, like collecting $5 a head to bring people from one end to another. No ships that sail from them or on them anymore. Old, creaky, leaky things that brought us from the mainland of Singapore Island to Pulau Brani, Sentosa's smaller, now unheard of sister, tucked to her side. Of course, you can't go to, Brown, to Brani anymore. The Navy took over and everyone was kicked off. I would say they flattened our houses or demolished them, or that they knocked them over, but I really have no idea because I don't know what it looks like anymore. The Coast Guard and the port took over after. When my son, when my son Zakaria enlisted for NS, he was sent there after his basic training. That was the first time I felt envy towards one of my kids. It shook me. I didn't like it. I felt it crawl its way up my body, burn my throat, and flood my mouth with its bile. I retched and heaved, but it didn't come out, no matter how much I could in my esophagus to try and force it out. It made a home for itself in my mouth and mingled with my saliva, and I taste it now more than ever. But how could I not envy him? I wanted to ask him, did you know? Did you know where you went? What land you were on? What water you crossed? Did you know that we once lived there and that we visited after they brought us to the mainland? Did you know that you were the first to set foot there after so many years? Did you ever walk through your base, whatever it was, and think, maybe this is where my mother lived? 
Maybe if he ripped up the floor, he might still find the foundations of our houses buried just beneath. He would have been, he would have been possessed like me with the desire to do so because he is my flesh and my blood and my water and my salt and my ocean that I poured into him when I birthed him. He would have known where he was standing. He must have smelled the salt wafting through the air so salty that he would have licked his lips unbidden in the middle of the day to taste it. He must have looked up at the full moon hanging like a clamshell in the ocean of the sky and seen stars that are no longer visible in our night sky, but he saw them because he has my eyes. I gave him my eyes. He must have walked out of the toilet in the base one day and suddenly he was there in my childhood home, barefoot like I was, every splinter in the wood tickling his feet. He could look out my window and see the sea beyond and he might have cried when he blinked and my eyes closed and his opened and he was back there in that Coast Guard base, the dust of my home somewhere beneath his feet. I'm sure I've seen the sunset before, but in this moment, I can't remember a single time. When the kids were young, my husband and I would bring them to East Coast Park with all their cousins on those, on those rare times when the stars aligned and everyone's off days landed on the same day. We'd arrive when the sun was still blazing overhead and find shelter underneath the shade of a tree, sharing our food with the ants and flies that were impossible to keep away. By nightfall, the flies were replaced with mosquitoes and the soothing sound of the waves crashing endlessly on the shore was interrupted periodically by someone slapping at their own skin. The kids spent the whole day in the ocean, emerging wrinkled like old fruit with sand, with sand stuck to their feet and lower legs. They ran in and out of the water, chasing the foam that covered the sand, in, the sand in a thin blanket. The older kids would walk out into the water until they were on their tiptoes and then cut through the waves and tread water somewhere near the horizon. They all knew how to swim or at least how to float, so we didn't worry. Maybe we should have. Sometimes they played this ridiculous game where they held on to a stray tree branch that came over from some nearby island or a bit of flotsam ejected from an unknown vessel and just let the waves spin them around. Beef satay skewers and marinated chickens sizzled over the small charcoal fire my husband built in one of the pits that lined the beach. We often heard the rats fighting over leftover bones and the fatty bits of satay that clung to the skewers in the rubbish bins, in the rubbish bins nearby, squeaking and shrieking and knocking one another loudly against the sides of the rusty metal bins. Sharif Aini and Suleiman scratched out of a small portable radio one of my brothers would ring and we'd, sing, and, and we'd sing along when we knew the words and ad-lib when we didn't. If I ever looked to the right, to the west, to see the sun setting, I don't remember doing so now. All I remember is the horizon chunked into pieces by the barges and huge container ships in the distance. I remember that if I stood where the water met the sand and felt the salty air sing through my nostrils and the wet sand burrow its way between my toes, I could no longer see Brani or Sumacau or any of the other small islands that clustered around Singapore's southern shoreline like eggs under a mother hen. I remember running my hand through the sand and the sea coming up and the, and through the sand and the sea and coming up with fistfuls of empty sand and empty shells, devoid of the mussels and cockles that the ocean once spat onto our shores for dinner. I remember seeing our kids in the distance. It could bring me to my knees now thinking about our kids. They couldn't see what I saw. They couldn't see our islands barricaded and hidden behind those ugly barges, our horizon broken apart and shattered. They didn't know that the sand was barren. This always happens. I blink and I miss something. The sun has set. The horizon has swallowed the red in the distance, leaving only the black night sky. Guests are starting to come and help themselves to the tulang we cooked earlier, the bone steak whose thick red juices coat their hands and run down their arms. Anissa and her fiancé get up from their table and make their way around slowly, greeting their guests with hugs and wide smiles for their friends and gentle kisses on the hands of their older relatives. Even her hair isn't like yours, Mariam. Yours was short and wavy, a perm you never had to pay for. Hers cascades down her back and drapes across her shoulders like a waterfall. When she looks over at me and smiles, I want to blink and see you in her place. I want to close my eyes and open them and see you walking around like you did on your wedding day smiling on your husband's arm. I will my eyes to see you, but they don't because you're not here. Only as big a fool as me will continue to try to bargain, will keep testing God after he has tested me time and time again in this life. I would give anything for you to be here, though I don't have anything more to give. I cannot pay as you paid. You are gone, Mariam, and all my suffering can't bring you back. Thank you. So thank you to our, our fabulous readers. Um, I found it an incredible set of readings and I really appreciate hearing the amount of work and thinking you put into the choices that you made. So let's give them all a big round of applause.
So just one last congratulations really on um, completing your masters and now you can go out into the world and become real writers. Uh, but uh, well done and congratulations and have a great evening when you leave here tonight. Thank you very much and thank you to the audience. And uh, I can see Dr. Weta clapping in the uh, distance. <laughs> so thank you very much.